on November 11, 1918, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the armistice ending the Great War went into effect. The global conflict that began in Sarajevo on June 28, 1914, with the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, ended in a railroad carriage at Compiègne with the stroke of a pen. The total number of casualties in World War I exceeded 41 million, 18 million dead, and some 23 million wounded, including those blinded in chemical weapons attacks. How did the demise of an unpopular royal from a middling empire in a backwater city lead to such a profound loss of human life? Why did this happen? The main course of history throughout the 19th century had been the rise of nationalism. We had the old established powers in the west of Great Britain and France and the newly emerging power of the United States across the Atlantic. We had the older European powers like the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, which were declining powers. Um, they were the least prepared for the changes that were about to come. Everyone knew if war was going to break out in Europe, it was going to start in the Balkans. It was called the powder keg of Europe, and it was called that for a reason. Bismarck, the former chancellor of Germany, who knew everything about geopolitics, had predicted 50 years before that when war broke out, the Balkans is where it would begin. Gavrilo Princip is a member of the Black Hand. The Black Hand uh, was a secret society. It was formed in the spring of 1911 by um, Serbian military officials. And uh, its purpose was to overthrow the government. It, more importantly, its purpose was to unify the Serbian people. Now, the Black Hand is this secret society. And what's funny or ironic is that Austro-Hungary basically declares war on Serbia after giving them the ultimatum. But the Serbian royal family was murdered by, wait for it, the Black Hand. The idea that Serbia itself was behind it is preposterous, even in hindsight. This was a, an anarchist kind of organization, and it was dangerous. Sarajevo is basically a provincial city. It's the capital of Bosnia. It's a fly speck on the map. Most people still don't know where it is. So you have the Archduke going to Sarajevo, and it's kind of a big deal. He's this stuffy guy. Nobody likes him. His, his uncle, who was the emperor, didn't like him either. But he's going to Sarajevo. It's a big state visit. It's a big deal that this guy is in town. Because, again, nothing ever happens in Sarajevo. He's riding in a, in a convertible, an open uh, car, uh, with his wife by his side, and an assassin throws a bomb, and it hits the back of the vehicle, which is where the folded convertible top is, and actually bounces off and lands on the street. And of course, right behind him, it's part of a motorcade, right behind him is another vehicle. And so sure enough, that vehicle you know, uh, goes over the top of the bomb, the bomb goes off and causes considerable damage and, and, uh, and quite a mess. The, the car con uh, containing the Archduke uh, they, they were trying to scramble, what do we do? Knowing that there might be other assassins uh, waiting ahead, they decided we'll be smart and we'll go an unexpected route. His driver wasn't told this plan, and so his driver turns down a street that was on the original route, and the guard that's next to him leans over and whispers to the driver, you know, no, we we're not going this way, we're supposed to go the other way. So the driver uh, uh, stops the car, puts it into reverse, is attempting to um, to exit uh, the street or turn around in the street, but it's a fairly narrow street. So Gavrilo Princip wanders off after the thing has failed, basically to have a sandwich and, and, and a drink, a good stiff drink to drown his sorrows in his miserable failure and probable arrest. And then he walks out into the sunshine and, and <laughs> the Archduke and his wife are right in front of him in this car that, that can't move. Uh, completely immobilized, like sitting ducks. This is not the age of, of assault rifles. The, the gun that he had is a Belgian model gun. I'm sure it was very nice, but it wasn't like a modern weapon. So the chances of something happening, does it misfire? Uh, does it not work? Does he fumble the, his hands because he's nervous? Uh, does he shoot wrong? No, he shoots fine. He kills both of them, which again is, is, is amazing that that happened, considering that they failed in literally every other aspect of what they were trying to do. Europe at that point, there were just an incredible number of 
interwoven sorts of allegiances and, and treaties and other kinds of things going on. And so really, there was this entanglement of all these different alliances. So after the assassination, Austro Serbia an ultimatum. It's a famous Serbian ultimatum. Basically, Serbia would have to cede their sovereignty over the investigation of the assassination, something they would never do. Serbia rejects the ultimatum. Austro-Hungary declares war on Serbia. Serbia has an agreement with Russia. Russia starts mobilizing. All of a sudden, Russia, Austro-Hungary are squaring off. Oh my God, now Great Britain and France have to enter the war on behalf of Russia. And then the next thing you know, all of Europe is embroiled in this horrible conflict. And, and why? Because some lesser noble that no one liked is dead. At the time, most of the crowned heads of Europe were related to each other. Um, Queen Victoria from uh, Great Britain uh, had seven direct descendants on the throne, and then there were two other uh, descendants through uh, uh, her, her side of the family. And so you have a situation where Tsar Nicholas II from Russia and George V from uh, Great Britain and Wilhelm II from Germany are not just cousins, they're first cousins. There are many photographs in the era, era uh, both when Victoria was still alive and then after she uh, passed away, of the family getting together for weddings and you know seaside holidays. Um, and so there are actual photographs where you can see Nicholas and George standing side by side. Uh, they look remarkably alike. In fact, uh, the coins of an era often tell a, a lot of the story. So if you take a look at a coin of George V and a coin of Nicholas II and look at the portraits uh, side by side, they don't look like cousins, they look like brothers. So it's really amazing. It's one of the cool things about a coin gives you a real tangible snapshot of, of the era that you're, uh, that you're dealing with. So Queen Victoria died in 1901. And all of the, the stuff that led to World War I uh, obviously happened in the years following that. Wilhelm II, who was uh, the, the other two cousins uh, were ganged up against, uh, is on record as saying that if Queen Victoria had still been alive, she probably wouldn't have let the cousins go to war. It's one of the great sort of what ifs of history. The war breaks out. And almost immediately, the battle lines are, are drawn. In the European theater, there were two main areas of conflict. There was the Western Front, um, where Germany engaged Britain, France, Belgium, and America, and forces drawn from the British Empire in a static war, uh, trench warfare, um, which was very different to what took place on the Eastern Front, where you had a, an, a war that perhaps resembled war, conflicts in the 19th century, a more mobile um, conflict with, with a loss and, with a loss and uh, gaining of land on a, on a yearly basis, unlike the, the static warfare of the West. So something has to happen to turn the tide, and a couple of things happened. First, the Russian Revolution happened, so all of a sudden, Boom, Russia pulls out of the war. Just like that, they were fighting the war and now suddenly they're not, which is a big deal because now the entire Eastern Front doesn't have to be uh, defended and Germany can concentrate its forces on the Western Front. The second thing that happens, of course, is that the United States enters the war. In 1914, when the war breaks out, the United States is more or less isolationist. They do not want to go to war in Europe. A lot of the population, the recent immigrant population of the United States is, first of all, there's a lot of Germans, so they don't want to go to war against their, their kinsmen. There's a lot of Irish. They don't want to go to war for Great Britain, who they don't like. It's a hard sell. Woodrow Wilson, who is president, also is an isolationist, does not want to get involved. How did the public opinion change? A couple of things. First, the Germans had their U-boats, and they would go around sinking ships to uh, enforce a blockade. And one of the ships they sunk was called the Lusitania. And there were several hundred U.S. citizens on board the ship that went down, they died. So that started to turn the tide against Germany in the popular opinion. And then there was something called the Zimmerman Memo. And this is probably, I think this is something people don't realize. Because again, the U.S., very isolationist. They do not want to get involved. The intelligence forces of Great Britain intercept a memo from the German ambassador to Mexico 
promising Mexico that they can take back California and New Mexico and Texas if they enter the war on the side of Germany against the United States in the event that the U.S. enters the war. Now this, this information is big news, right? This is really the thing that turns the tide. So the Zimmerman memo majorly changed the, the public opinion from one of isolationism to one of, we got to take these people out and take care of business. Basically, it's a tag team where the U.S. goes in for Russia. And effectively, because I think they hadn't been fighting for the length of time that everybody else had, that turned the tide and the war ended. One of the reasons why the First World War was so devastating, whilst there was such a great loss of life, was the introduction of new technology. Machine guns, more powerful munitions, and at the end of the war, things like tanks, aircraft, and of course, chemical weapons. Um, horrific things that were banned as a consequence of the war. Um, unimaginable today. This combined with a lack of new techniques. The generals in charge were employing largely, at least at first, 19th century tactics using 20th century weapons. And we can see that the loss of life is quite often down to that. Loss of life during the First World War was unprecedented. Um, and it's something perhaps that resonates perhaps greater in Europe than it does in the United States. Um, whole generations of young men were lost to the war. Drive across Europe and look at the number of war memorials there and the lists of the dead in small villages and you can perhaps feel the loss to, in, to individual small communities. From an American perspective, you can perhaps compare it to the Civil War. If you were to drive around the Northeast United States and go to small towns of Vermont and look at the Civil War Memorial and think about the size of the town at the time, the number of people lost, you can get an idea of the effect of the First World War in Europe. More people died in the last year uh, of the war than died in the four years of the, of the total war. And the reason for that uh, had to do with the flu. Uh, there was a Spanish flu pandemic that happened, and this is directly a result of uh, warfare in the trenches. The trenches were an extremely uh, filthy place, uh, and a strain of flu developed that basically just um, took out millions of people across the continent. It killed more people in that, that single year than the bubonic plague had done. Most people, if they think about the worst possible plague in history, they think of the bubonic plague. But uh, the Spanish flu pandemic actually uh, killed more people than the bubonic plague. After the war, the entire map changes. Um, there are entire monarchies that are gone, banking powers, political powers, you know, major sort of social institutions in Europe are just uh, irrevo irrevocably changed by the war and in some cases disappear off the face of the map altogether. While the central powers lost, no one really won. The war left Great Britain, once the world's great banker, in deep financial difficulty. France, embittered and vengeful. Russia and the hand of the Bolshevik revolutionaries. By the end of the war, the German, Austro-Hungarian, Russian, and Ottoman empires had all collapsed. When the smoke cleared, the appetite for war in Europe had been satisfied for the foreseeable future, or so it seemed. On November 11, 1918, no one could have foretold that an even more catastrophic war was right around the corner.